Uh, good evening, uh, Thermo One class. Um, since uh, the audio was bad on the first uh, attempt to record uh, this uh, initial lecture out of Chapter 8, I thought I would try to redo it this evening and send you the link here shortly. <clears throat> so this is our schedule. As you've seen before, uh, we are on November 3rd, so we're going to do uh, about 40 minutes. Uh, there was a 40 minute uh, lecture posted on the solution to the problems in uh, test two, which hopefully you've looked at. And then this one will make up the rest of today's class time. Um, so you can see after today, we have one, two, three, four lectures in chapter eight on the uh, Rankine cycle in different, uh, 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 different modifications of the cycle, different uh, enhancements that are done to increase the efficiency of it. And then we'll have, uh, uh, that's chapter eight. And then we'll have four lectures out of chapter 10. I'll get some homework problems out to you. I'll start looking over shortly on eight and we should be good to go. So uh, coming down, uh, not that far from the end of the course and the final exam. Okay, so let's jump to the slides here. And so this is the rank and cycle review. Um, so this is a, uh, a 150 megawatt utility scale generating unit, uh, Kingston steam plant, on what beautiful Watch Bar Lake as you drive towards Knoxville. You can see the plant uh, going towards Knoxville. It's on your left, uh, right about the uh, Kingston exit. That's 352, I believe. Uh, and uh, so just to give you some idea of the level of complication uh, that we see, uh, this here's our boiler over here, 88.6% efficient. And uh, we show some losses, steam losses, uh, water losses from it for various reasons. Uh, we're not quite a million pounds an hour at 1815 uh, PSIA, pounds per square inch absolute. And uh, the temperature is 1,000 uh, degrees um, Fahrenheit. And the enthalpy is uh, let me turn this pointer on here. There we go. Uh, the enthalpy is 1480.3 BTUs per pound mass. Here's a little legend down here where you see what the symbols are. Uh, that feeds over to a high pressure uh, turbine. Uh, we expand uh, from 1815 down to about 625. And then we have an extraction pipe coming out, which feeds the number one feed water heater. This is a closed heater. So we've got number one, two, and three, all closed heaters. You see the, uh, uh, this, uh, this is the uh, pressure of the extraction. This is the temperature. This is the enthalpy. I guess this is the uh, pressure at which the heater operates. Um, and then this is an open heater. This is where the uh, steam and water actually kind of mix together. Uh, and then we have three more closed feed water heaters. So we have a total of uh, seven. Um, so these are the extraction ports. This is the uh, steam that goes and the idea is to boost the temperature of the feed water before it gets back to the boiler. We'll, we'll uh, discuss this a lot more in the future lectures. Um, so then the, the steam not extracted at number one gets down to the end of the high pressure turbine and some of it goes to the number two feed water heater with another extraction and the rest of it goes back to the boiler. This is called reheat steam. So it's at uh, uh, 640.2. Uh, 450 pounds here. By the time it gets uh, through the boiler again, it's going to be reheated to a thousand, but the pressure is going to drop to uh, 405 
going into the uh, interceptor valve, which controls steam flow into the intermediate pressure turbine. Uh, we have you know, additional extractions as we go through the IP. And we have two low pressure turbines. This is called the crossover from the, to get the steam over to the low pressure turbines after the IP turbine. Uh, condenser, which is operating at two inches of mercury absolute, which is about one PSI. A, and we got a generator here that's, uh, it's not quite uh, 150 megawatts, 149,746 kW, so pretty close. Uh, we got a little pump up and down through here. And then, um, so this is our uh, feed water making its way back. This is condensate that's being pumped into the line. Um, come down after the uh, open heater, we have the main boiler feed pumps that then pump it through the last three feed water heaters and get it into the uh, boiler. So that's just roughly what's going on. I just thought you might enjoy seeing uh, a little bit of this. Uh, this is the 200 megawatt unit. I believe there are four of those at Kingston. And uh, so the steam flows up this a little bit bigger. This is not quite 1.3 million pounds an hour, 1,050 on the temperature. Enthalpy is up to 1510.9 uh, and feeds the high pressure turbine. Again, we have multiple extractions from the turbines going to the feed water heaters. Uh, steam eventually goes back to the boiler for uh, reheat. And uh, it's, uh, let's see, we're coming out. Uh, let's see, we're going back here. This is the line back to the boiler coming out here. And then we are going back to 1,050 and then to the IP turbine and the low pressure turbines, the condenser some pumps and all that sort of thing. So anyway, I thought you might enjoy seeing uh, some of a real um, utility scale uh, unit diagram. Okay, so uh, here we're gonna talk about um, over the past years from uh, 08 through uh, part of 19 into 20, we're looking at uh, the uh, electric utility, electric generation sector. Um, at each point in time, you can see what percent of the power was generated by various uh, fuel types. So back in the day, we were someplace around 50% uh, of the power was generated with coal. Uh, this is nuclear. Nuclear is pretty flat and continues to be. Uh, nuclear plants are very expensive. Uh, the fuel is relatively cheap, so if you have a uh, nuclear plant, you're probably going to run it uh, wide open as much as you can. Uh, we see that as coal has declined, natural gas has picked up with the advent of fracking and directional drilling. Uh, gas prices have gotten so cheap that the gas is as cheap as coal, and it's a whole lot cleaner and emits less CO2, about half the CO2 for a given amount of power generation. And so natural gas has kind of been uh, the go-to fuel in the last uh, number of years. Uh, we see renewables is certainly on the rise and I think will uh, continue to be. Uh, let's see. So, and they, they note up here in the caption to this figure that in March, renewables uh, share of generation exceeded coals the second month in a row. So back down here, you see coal is down and uh, renewables are up above it. So that's kind of a first. Uh, so renewables are coming on. Coal is going to continue to decline. I would say it'll take 15 to 20 years before we get completely off of coal. But uh, I think it's coming. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is looking at uh, data uh, 
annual data for 2010 and 2015. And here uh, we can see that uh, uh, natural gas has gone from 22% in 2010 to 31%. And if we had more recent data on this, we would see it's continued to uh, increase. Uh, coal uh, was 44% in 2010. It has shrunk in five years by 14% down to 30%. Uh, nuclear, again, is pretty constant. You know, it takes a long, long time uh, to uh, uh, build and finance and construct and, you know, get a nuclear power plant going. So I'm not aware that there's too many on the drawing boards. I think nuclear is probably going to continue to be flat. Over time, when they get, reach the end of the useful life, they have to be retired. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, let's see, we see renewables. From 5%, excuse me, to uh, 9%. And then we see conventional hydro. It's pretty flat, basically, uh, based on how much rain we get. The more uh, rain, you know, the more power we get from hydro. And a couple other, other and uh, petroleum. Um, petroleum showing an increase here, it looks like. Um, well, let's see. Now I take it back. This is the petroleum right here. So it's pretty constant. And then other, there's biomass and a little bit of other stuff gets used, but it's pretty small. Um, okay, so your author points out, uh, to meet our national power needs, there are challenges related to declining economically recoverable supplies of non-renewable energy sources, such as uranium, <laughs> coal and natural gas. So what is this? Uh, between these two, that's pretty close to what, 50%. So almost 84% of our power generation in 16 was from non-renewable sources. So in terms of getting a, uh, completely on renewables, uh, we've got some work to do. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, technology takes a big uh, jump in like we did with uh, fracking and all, and all of a sudden recoverable supplies of natural gas and oil jumped up significantly for the U.S. because we had better uh, drilling and extraction techniques. So, you know, they're not making any more, but the amount that we can get to sometimes increases with increases in uh, uh, drilling and recovery technologies. Uh, the effects of global climate change and other environmental and human and safety issues uh, is certainly a challenge. Um, climate change is, you know, somewhat controversial, I guess. I don't know. I'm a little skeptical about some of the claims about all of the impact of man-made sources and emissions. Uh, I'm sure there is an impact and I don't claim to be uh, very knowledgeable on it. It's not my field of study. So anyway, you're free to make up your own mind. Uh, certainly there are some health and safety issues, let's say with coal. Uh, there's uh, mercury gets emitted some from the stack. Uh, we get particulates, uh, small from the pulverized uh, coal ash particles. Uh, they can get in the air and uh, lodge in people's lungs. That can be a health issue. So there's no doubt that uh, there certainly are health and safety issues related to uh, power generation. Uh, we do have uh, worldwide, we have a, a rapidly increasing demand for power, excuse me, uh, owing to increasing population and just uh, as societies develop, they become more energy intensive. The U.S. Uh, by far uses more energy per capita, I believe, than uh, any other uh, country on earth. Others, I'm sure China is catching up quick. Um, today, we are still dependent on coal, natural gas, and nuclear, all of which are non-renewable. We said that. Uh, however, renewables are growing rapidly. Uh, Definitely true. 
Okay, so on this slide, we're looking at um, the type of power plant, you know, what it's fueled by, coal, natural gas, nuclear, oil, biomass, geothermal, solar concentrating, uh, hydroelectric, wind, solar photovoltaic, fuel cells, and current or tidal power. Then we note whether it's renewable or non-renewable, so this would be non-renewable if there's a yes, and renewable over here if there's a yes. And then the thermodynamic cycle, if there is one, that that uh, type of plant is dependent upon. So we see coal, non-renewable, yes. Natural gas, yes. Nuclear, yes. Oil, yes. And fuel cells can use uh, Natural gas, they can use hydrogen too, I believe, which could be, depending on how it's generated, could be considered renewable, but the author doesn't. Most of them run on natural gas, I believe. It's not a combustion. Uh, it's an ion separation kind of a process. Uh, renewable sources, we see all of these, uh, biomass, geothermal, solar, uh, hydroelectric, wind, and solar again, different technology. And we see Rankine cycle for coal, uh, nuclear, oil, uh, biomass, geothermal, and solar concentrating. So that Rankine cycle has a pretty uh, broad application in uh, power generation, as we will see going forward. Okay, uh, in your textbook, this chapter eight uh, shows four alternative vapor power plant configurations, and they are, uh, there's a, a fossil fuel uh, vapor power plant. Uh, there's a pressurized uh, water nuclear reactor vapor power plant, concentrating solar, geothermal, and so, uh, in each of those four types of vapor power plant, the working fluid is alternately vaporized and condensed. So when we call it a vapor power plant, that means that we're going to boil the working fluid and then we're going to condense it. And it kind of goes back and forth. So that's what vapor, uh, vapor power plant uh, implies in a thermodynamic sense. A key difference among the plants is the origin of the energy required to vaporize the working fluid. And I mentioned organic Rankine cycle. Um, this uh, uses a different working fluid, some sort of an organic fluid. It could be a refrigerant. Uh, but the, the key uh, characteristic is that it boils at a much lower temperature than water. and um, so if you say you have waste heat uh, at an industrial plant, it's possible to uh, let the waste heat uh, be the energy source for the boiler in an organic Rankine cycle. And because the, uh, uh, the other working fluids will boil at a much lower temperature, then it's feasible to recover some fairly low temperature heat and generate electricity with it. So that's kind of the idea behind the organic Rankine cycle. Uh, here is uh, the fossil fueled plants, and the author likes to divide it up into subsystems. So we have subsystem A, where the combustion, fuel air going in, combustion is going on, flue gases go up the stack. Then uh, from subsystem A to subsystem B, we transfer heat into the working fluid, which causes it. Uh, you know, to be vaporized, um, could be saturated or superheated, depends on the cycle design. And then that uh, goes into a steam turbine, which then uh, drops pressure on the steam. And then the process creates a torque that turns the generator, basically an electric motor. You turn the shaft on, you get electricity out. Uh, and then the low pressure, low temperature of steam coming out the exit of the turbine goes to the condenser where we use lake water or atmospheric air or some cooling media to uh, carry off the heat. Uh, we 
we're probably going to have fans or pumps or something. Uh, we could have a parabolic cooling tower to cool off the water, which would not. This this large parabolic shaped tower doesn't doesn't have fans associated with it. So that's that's why you're willing to build those huge things, is it because you don't uh, have to expend any energy to make them operate. Uh, so then uh, we spray this warm water that came through the condenser. A little bit of it evaporates out the top. We show the plume and it cools down the rest of the water, which then gets uh, pumped back in. Uh, there is makeup water, yeah, for this showing right here because we're evaporating some. It's the evaporation that cools down the flow. So at any rate, that's a, a brief walk through a fossil fuel plant. Okay, so you notice that we can replace this part over here that produces the heat it goes into the cycle and replace it with a uh, uh, pressurized water nuclear reactor. Okay, and so here you've got the reactor vessel, your control rods. Um, so we circulate uh, some sort of a fluid through here to pick up the heat, bring it over here to the boiler, and then we've got uh, our feed water uh, from the pump coming in. It's vaporized into steam, goes through the turbine, condenser, turbine turns a generator, we get electricity. So all of this stuff looks just the same as it did over here. What's different is we have a nuclear reactor instead of a boiler, okay? So, and then we could use a uh, concentrating uh, solar uh, uh, collectors that concentrate the sun onto a, uh, uh, they call it a, a, a power tower, which uh, basically melts and transfers all that heat to a molten salt, usually. The molten salt gets pumped through the heat exchanger, and then we put water through the other side, and this <coughs> generates steam, which goes to the turbine, which turns the generator, and so once we get, you know, this changed from the reactor, from the fossil fuel boiler, but uh, the rest of the cycle is very similar. Temperatures and pressures may change, but the basic components are the same. Uh, and here is the geothermal uh, power plant where we have drilled down into the Earth's crust. Hopefully there are places where this is pretty close to the surface. And so we can get some uh, hot water or some uh, steam out, run it through a heat exchanger. And then this heat exchanger basically is the boiler uh, to produce the vapor uh, the steam to go into the turbine, turn the generator, come out to the condenser pump. So it's the same cycle other than the fact that we get the heat from the ground and put it through this heat exchanger. Okay, so fossil fuel vapor power plant. Uh, so we're gonna break it down into these subsystems that uh, we kind of already mentioned before that we basically combust and liberate the heat. We transfer the heat into subsystem B uh, where you know, the steam goes through the turbine condenser and the pump. And then C would be the uh, electric generator. And then D is the heat rejection. So we have to condense. Uh, the state coming out of here is probably oh, 80, 80 to 90% vapor. It's just low temperature, low pressure, but it still has a bunch of energy in it. And so we have to condense that so we can pump it back uh, and complete the cycle get ready to go around one more time. Uh, so subsystem A provides the heat transfer of energy needed to vaporize water circulating in subsystem B. Uh, in fossil fuel plants, this heat transfer has its origin in the combustion of the fuel. So we burn the natural gas or coal, whatever, produces heat, we transfer the heat. Uh, subsystem B 
Well, excuse me, expands um, through the turbine developing power. Uh, the water then condenses and returns to the boiler. We've talked about that. Subsystem C, power is developed by the turbine uh, as it drives the electric generator. Electricity comes out. And then subsystem D removes energy by heat transfer arising from steam condensing in subsystem B. So I think you got a pretty good uh, overall view of what's going on here. Uh, each unit of mass of water periodically undergoes a thermodynamic cycle as it circulates through the components of subsystem B. This cycle is the Rankine cycle. That's the name given to it. Uh, we can follow the little bouncing blue ball around the cycle. Okay, so let's uh, <clears throat> review uh, our thermodynamics just a little bit here. So uh, first law of thermo requires the network developed by a system undergoing a power cycle to equal the net energy added by heat transfer to the system. So so long as it's a power cycle, we know that we're going to transfer in some heat from a high temperature source. We're going to reject some heat to a low temperature sink, and the difference in those is the work. So we got to transfer more in here, less out here, so we can get some conversion to work. And so in an equation form, uh, the net power, so we got a dot over it, so it's the rate of doing work, or net cycle power, is equal to the heat transfer rate in minus the heat transfer rate rejected to the cold body. So this one comes from the hot body, this one goes to the cold body. The difference is the work, or the power in this case, coming out. And the thermal efficiency uh, of a power cycle is the rate of doing the work. Uh, that's, that's what we want, divided by the costly input, which is the rate of adding uh, heat to the boiler from the hot body. Typically, that would be the combustion of fuel. Okay, the second law of thermodynamics requires the thermal efficiency to be less than 100%. Recall, we cannot uh, transfer heat from a single reservoir into uh, a specific device, have it produce work, and not reject some heat. If we did that, it would make that cycle 100% efficient, and that's not possible. Okay, so uh, thermo, the second law of thermo requires the thermal efficiency to be less than uh, 100%. That's the same thing I just said. Uh, most of today's vapor power plants have thermal efficiencies ranging up to 40%. On a really, really, really good day, uh, I'd say typical these coal plants would be 30 to 32, 33% is more likely. Okay, this is an important statement. Thermal efficiency tends to increase as the average temperature at which energy is added by heat transfer increases. So if we can increase the combustion temperature or increase uh, the temperature inside the furnace, we can up the thermal efficiency. The problem is, having materials that can survive over time at, at these elevated temperatures. So uh, the folks that build these units push it pretty good because they know that uh, the hotter they can, they can uh, uh, generate the steam at, the greater the, uh, the potential efficiency that we'll have. And also, uh, and or you can say the average temperature at which energy is rejected by heat transfer decreases. So if we can make the lake colder or we can make the air colder, then we can help the efficiency of the plant. But it's kind of hard to do that on, uh, when you got something the scale of a utility uh, size uh, power generating unit. Uh, improved thermodynamic performance of power cycles. Um, 
as measured by increased thermal efficiency, for example, also accompanies reduction in irreversibilities and losses. So, you know, I always think about that as friction, dissipative, turbulence, uh, anything we can do to minimize those losses will uh, help our efficiency. The extent of improved power cycle performance is limited, however, by constraints imposed by thermodynamics and economics. Uh, again, you know, one good example is that exotic materials may be out there that we could uh, retube the boiler with, but the boiler is so big that we just can't afford the maybe the best, strongest materials that would allow us to go up in, in terms of temperature of the steam generation. Okay, the Rankine cycle, each unit of mass uh, of water circulating through the interconnected components of subsystem B, uh, figure from figure 8.1a, uh, undergoes a thermodynamic cycle known as the Rankine cycle. Uh, there are four principal control volumes involving these components. They are the turbine, the condenser, the pump, and the boiler. You can think about that as uh, perhaps a heat exchanger where we combust fuel and then transfer uh, the energy uh, into the working fluid. Uh, all energy transfers by work and heat are taken as positive in the directions of the arrows. All the schematic and energy balances are written accordingly. So when you see these arrows, whatever direction things are going, that's taken to be a positive uh, in that direction. Okay, Rankine, so the processes of the Rankine cycle are, one to two, vapor expands through the turbine developing work. Uh, two to three, vapor condenses to liquid through heat transfer uh, to the cooling water. Uh, process three to four, liquid is then pumped into the boiler requiring work input. This is where the high pressure in the cycle is established by the pump. And for one, liquid is heated to saturation and evaporated in the boiler through heat transfer from uh, the energy source. Okay, so we have an engineering model here. Uh, each component is analyzed as a control volume at steady state. Uh, the turbine and pump operate adiabatically, i.e. no heat transfer, and kinetic potential energy changes are ignored. So if you apply in mass and energy rate balances, this works out to be uh, pretty nice. So the work, the rate, uh, doing work for the power per unit mass out of the turbine is just for, uh, you know, this is a simple turbine with no extractions. It's just H1 minus H2, the enthalpy at which steam comes in minus the enthalpy at which steam goes out. For the condenser, again, the rate of heat rejection Q dot out per unit mass is just H2 minus H3 just the relative enthalpies. For the pump, uh, the uh, pump power per unit mass is H4 minus H3. And guess what, the boiler, uh, the rate of uh, adding heat to the working fluid uh, in the boiler per unit mass uh, flowing is H1 minus H4. So that's all pretty simple. Okay performance parameter. So we have the um, thermal efficiency of the cycle. So it's the, uh, it's the power divided by the rate of energy in input uh, to the control volume. And so the work of the cycle is the work per unit mass uh, out of the turbine minus the uh, work per unit mass uh, of the pump. Uh, divided by the mass flow rate. And then we divide that by uh, Q dot uh, 
m uh, divided by the mass flow rate. So we've got an m dot. Everything is a specific quantity then. And with that nomenclature, we see that uh, all of these these differences, these terms, become just the enthalpy uh, at one minus two minus the quantity H4 minus H3 divided by H1 minus H3. And if you go back and look at the diagram, uh, those enthalpy differences are, are correct. Okay, back work ratio uh, is important. It's uh, pretty low for the Rankine cycle because it's easy to pump uh, water, which is almost incompressible. And so we see the back work ratio is the pump work uh, the rate of pump work per unit mass divided by the rate of power generation in the turbine per unit mass. And so that's H4 uh, minus H3 divided by H1 minus H2. Uh, back work ratio is characteristically low for vapor power plants, for instance, in uh, example 8.1, the power required by the pump is less than 1% power developed by the turbine. If this was a, a Brayton cycle, a gas turbine cycle, um, the amount of compressor energy it takes is 30, 35, it could even be 40 percent of that produced by the turbine. So it's uh, really important. Uh, provided states 1 through 4 are fixed, equations 8, 1 through 8, 6 can be applied to determine the performance of simple vapor power plants adhering to the Rankine, the Rankine <coughs> cycle. Since these equations are developed from mass energy balances, they apply equally when irreversibilities are present and for idealized performance in the absence of such effects. So, uh, we may do this, we may develop the equations uh, with the simplifying assumptions of uh, uh, internally reversible processes, but once we get the equations and we see they're all involved in properties, then we can relax that constraint. Okay, uh, the ideal Rankine cycle uh, provides a simple setting to study aspects of vapor power plant performance. The ideal cycle adheres to the following modeling assumptions. Frictional pressure drops are absent uh, during flows through the boiler and condenser. Thus, these processes occur at constant pressure. And flows through the turbine and pump occur adiabatically and without irreversibility. Thus, these processes are isentropic. Okay, I think, yeah, we're going to stop there. I think that's a pretty good place. So I will get this posted and uh, see you or at least be in touch with you about uh, Thursday. Thanks very much.